and um, before that worked manner, so for 29 years or something like that. But for a long time, so he, he understands this market probably better than most people you come across. So we're going to record this presentation, as we said before, and we're going to put it online for the benefit of all of the teams within the IMEC UAS Challenge. Um, there'll be plenty of time after Rob's finished, I don't know how long he's playing, 45 minutes or something like that? Something like that. Something like that. We'll wing it, right? If it lasts an hour, then it lasts an hour. And then, obviously, lots of questions, and you can, you guys can uh, can talk through your platforms if you wish, or ask some questions, or do whatever you need to do. So, I think I'll leave the floor now to Rob to uh, to kick off and um, give us the, the, the wisdom of his uh, years of service. Thanks. Over to you, Rob. Thanks. Okay, so um, I was one of the judges for the UAS Challenge last year, and. I will also well, plan to be a judge for this, this year's challenge, so all, all things being equal, I should be there um, at the fly-off. Um, the fly-off was a really good event last year, um, there was a 100% crash record amongst the students, so um, there was a, it was a very entertaining day, I think it highlighted just how difficult the challenge was. I think there will be some changes um, in the way marks are allocated this year following on from seeing exactly how difficult it was last year. I brought um, rent a crowd with me from, from the office in Tech Ever. So Roland joined me at the, the challenge last last year, so um, so I should introduce everybody. Alex has been working at Tech Ever for two months, three months? As has Mark and James, so both, both, but Mark and James both competed last year in the UAS challenge. Uh, Mark's team won the business case section. Uh, Mark's from Loughborough University. James' ooh, team ooh. <laughs> James's team <laughs> won the final presentation award as well. So that these guys, um, as well as me being here, it's useful for you guys to um, you know grip them with your questions afterwards as well and, and find out how they found it. So uh, I'll. Why am I talking to you today? The reason is that you get marks towards the, the final um, score in your UAS challenge on most viable business proposition. There's two, there was two submissions last year, one in the um, CDR and one in um, the final design review prior to flight. So you, but you, you'll get marks allocated at both of those sections. And the idea is to show that you've thought about what um, what actually you could do with a, with a product like this, with a, the system you're designing, could it have a place in a commercial marketplace? Who would pay for it? What would they be willing to pay? To look at what problem that solves for your customers, and also then to also give you practice of presenting at the final fly-off. So you've got a, a commercial element within the, the case. I don't think you guys gave any marks last year for the business case on there? Mm, if there was, pretty low. So, <laughs> so it, it's, you know, it, it's one of those things that um, it may not be part of what you get marked on at the university, but it's certainly something that would benefit you actually when, once you go out into industry and you have a position in industry, understanding how the business side of, the business, of things works and how um, at the end of the day everybody needs to get paid. And it's all, uh, you know, how the, that works. So the problem with doing a business case, and the first, first few times I, I started to work into this area, I was incredibly uncomfortable because it, it, basically doing a business case is trying to predict the future. And if anyone can predict the future accurately, you're wasting your time here, go outside and do something else, go and play the lottery, you know, play the horses and, and make loads of money. It's difficult. Predicting the future is difficult, particularly from an engineering and science background because you're dealing with high unknowns and high variance in, in the numbers. So the, the best approach I can advise you to take is to try and use some of that engineering experience within your business case approach. So say, this is what we see, think is the most likely, these are the, the least likely things to happen, this is the, the, you know, the absolute, if, if all our ships come in, this is the extreme end of the of the numbers and try and get a feel for how the, the numbers could vary within your business case 
and also try and use things like Pareto analysis. As, you know, as engineers and scientists, we should be at an advantage for doing things like this because we come from a highly numerical background and, and understand you know, the, how the numbers should play through preparing a business case. At the end of the day, though, it's trying to balance risk against reward. So in any business proposition, there will be an element of risk. People understand that. People expect it. In order to make a significant amount of money, you need there to be an element of risk within the business case. But the, the rewards should pay off against that element of risk. What, um, the, the kind of thing that, that, I mean, I hope you guys have seen things like Dragon's Den and you've seen websites like Kickstarter where the, the, the person who has the uh, project that they want to perform, they, go, they present the case in such a way that they try and highlight the uh, the rewards of the project and they try and show that they've minimized the risks and all that sort of stuff is that is it would be you know the great to see within the business cases that you prepare in the in the um in actually when you submit now i'm not talking when i talk about risk i'm not talking about technical risk so i'm not talking about the risk of a uav wandering off or the risk of losing gps while you're in flight the sorts of risks that perhaps you might want to consider are what happens if somebody leaves, leaves the team you know and, and you're trying to develop a product and a key member of your, your team leaves. What about if there's a change in the regulatory environment and the weight class at the moment is defined at seven kilos and you build a product that's six and a half and they drop the weight to six and your product is no longer, no longer viable. There's a whole load of, of risks within the business side of things that could take what you've done as, from a technical perspective and completely make it an un, a non-viable product. So what I want to present a little bit today is to talk about the business model canvas, which is something now that we're seeing being used um, by routes such as Innovate UK. Um, people are, this is a, an open source um, business model generation tool that's, that they've put, you know, you're in the, the internet generation, a lot of this information on how to create um, business models is out there on, on the internet. And this is a one page approach to try to summarize uh, all of the different aspects of a business, moving from internal to external, building about activities and costs. Um, I'm going to try and take you through that today and try and give you a feel for the way that you can analyse the way that your business works. Um, in terms of how this, this goes about it actually being implemented, the, the actual activities that we identify with it... Um, they will translate into actual day-to-day -day activity. So this is just a way of being able to capture a, a one slide. Typically, people that work in business have short attention spans that we, you know, that we are a bit magpie in terms of our thinking and tend to jump from one thing to another. So how can you capture, you know, if you were trying to come to an investor with a business proposition, how could you capture your business in, in one page and summarise to them what the, the, the actual value is of your business and what the potential is within that business. Dragon's Den is interesting, they don't allow them to, to do PowerPoints or slides particularly, so, and they don't, allow, they don't tend to give them a business plan that's written down, it tends to be that you interrogate the person verbally, and that's hard. To have all those figures and numbers in your head is, is difficult. But, when you do your presentation at the final fly-off, I'd advise you to approach it that you're trying to pitch for investment. That you're coming and you're saying, I have this business idea, this is what we'd like, and we, we, you know, we need to capture the investment of the people who are there. If not financially, at least that they invest emotionally in your business. I'll work that out in a minute, I promise. Um, so some of the tools that you can use in generating your, your business case are things like SWOT analysis. This can be applied uh, at a decision point. So you can work out, so the top half is in, in, internally, what things are we good at, what things are we not so good at, what things um, within the product function well, what things do we think we need to improve. <clears throat> and also then to look at the external opportunity. So Regulation at the moment within the UAV industry is set to change and that regulatory environment is, is moving and that presents opportunities to, to companies who want to operate the online site, for example. But there's also a threat 
that the regulatory environment may change to such an extent that you're not allowed to do that, uh, that airspace um, regulations would change, or that an accident would potentially ground all of the UAV systems in the, in the country. Am I going about the right pace? Has anyone got any questions so far? All good? One of the big things we saw last year in the business cases was that people anticipated they were going to start making revenue too quickly. So a, a lot of the, um, the, the revenue streams were, and we start selling products in month one, we get paid in month one, and then we have a flat sales of two a month for the next four years. Of course, that's not typically the way that um, new products are sold. Typically, this, this is a diffusion of innovation curve. It's this bell, bell distribution of uh, adoption of new technologies. And this is a little bit more realistic. Unless you're Apple, you don't go out and sell a million on day one. You know, typically, you're going to sell ones and twos for the first few months, and that it's going to take time for you to generate a customer base and it's going to take time for you to actually establish yourself in, as a presence in the marketplace. If you were to take a product like this to market in your own right as a company, you have no heritage, no history, no reputation. All of that stuff takes time to establish, and it's not going to come you know, in the first month. You know, to actually take money off somebody, real money, to take it away from somebody to buy a product for you in, in month one of trading is... Um, optimistic in the extreme. So, so one of the things we're looking for in the, in the business case preparation is some realism. And for, for people to show that they've thought this through, that they've actually anticipated what the likely cycle is within the business and how long it will take to get, get to a point where they can start making a profit. The MOD are quite clear on the way that they do procurement. So this is the CAD mid cycle. I, you, we could go through, uh, they've got a whole load of other acronyms, like tepid oil, which is my favourite one. Um, this is to talk about the way that new, again, that new technologies and new concepts and new ways of working get adopted. So there's a concept phase and then there's some technology assessment. So within your business case, if you give a new product to somebody, are they going to want to see how it works? Are they going to want to assess it on a trial basis? Are you going to need to do customer demonstrations and have you costed that within your business model? How much is it going to, co going to cost you to do, uh, to do your manufacturing? What's the underlying cost of manufacturing? Labour, heat, light, all of that sort of stuff. How are you going to build the product? And how much is it going to cost you to support it while it's in service? So if a customer is using your product and they need spares, if they need, want software upgrades, if they want new features, how, how do you go about supporting customers while they use it? Disposal is a... a, a a phrase that um, the MOD use, but it, I think it, for, for your sort of uh, uh, concept and for your sort of business, think about upgrade. You know, how does it, where, where's the, what's the lifespan of one of these systems that if you were to sell this, how long can the customer use it before you start saying to them, you know, now's the sort of time you should be thinking at that the, the, the market's moved on, technology's moved on, we'd like to offer you some upgrades within, within the system. And then that brings you back round the, the loop to a new concept or a new product that takes you through the cycle again. In terms of the way that um, the business is, goes through different gates, I, I don't know if you guys come through this phase gate development process. Do you guys, do if you teach this at Southampton, do you talk I about teach all of this. Well, all of, yeah. And more. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm sure you guys do. I'm not not familiar, but so I'll take it as yeah, no, don't do it. I'll take it as red. As red. But Big pressure. The um, typically you, there's a number of points when when you take a, a concept through development. There's a number of co points where you can kill it. So there's a number of things where and I, I, when I talk to people, they they can they they you talk to other companies. They say oh, I'm really I've just failed my internal gate three. And that means that we're, gonna, we're not going to go forward until I've established a key element of, of the business case. Or, you know, we've actually on gate five, we've, we've had a key set of testing and, and validation uh, you know, 
deliverables, we had to be able to show this functionality within the product, and we failed it. So therefore, we do not go through to product launch. So all of this sort of um, gated development process is something that would be good again to show in the you know within your business case. If you know you were to look at where you're getting within the UAS challenge, then where do we think we'd be in terms of actually a development process? I hate talking without any interaction. So where do you think we'd be if you at the end of the UAS challenge? Where do you think on what? Where, where do you think you'd, you'd have? Six, six, five, six, five, yeah. yeah, I think you'd be at gate five. But you'd have a business case, <coughs> you'd have done some development, and you show some test and validation. But are you ready to launch a product? Yeah. Possibly not. You know, have you got all of the supply chain ready? If somebody comes in and says, great, I'd like to buy 100, could you actually cope with, with that within your, within your business model? And then scaling up, you know, how do you go from selling onesie, onesie twosies as you're doing your, 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 uh, your, your, your initial demonstrations and then how do you go forward into to taking that to, to volume to market? So in terms of the business model canvas, what I want to do is unpack it a little bit and try and show you how all the different, different elements hang together and where those things can be presented within your business case to show really what I'm looking for is if I'm sat as a mock investor on the business case and I'm re reading your report, I want to know you've got it all covered. I want to know you've thought, thought through all the risks. I want to know you've taken on board all of the potential um, snares and the potential things that can trip up your, your business and that everything's under control and that I don't need to worry and I can give you some money. And that involves covering things from both an internal and an external aspect. So the stuff that's inside the business, I, should, I want to make really sure you understand how your, your cost model's built up, how your business is going to function, but also the stuff that's outside the business, which is a bit more difficult to control. I want to see that you've mitigated as many of those risks as possible. And in typical entrepreneurial start, I shall start in the middle of the template and not work from one end to the, to the other. But the value proposition is the bit where what we do internally meets what happens externally. So why do customers come to us? What is it that we can add to the way that they do their business that would make them buy a product? And what what I'd like to do later is try and work through an example. We'll, we'll pick a, a business and we'll mark, map it up onto this tool. But the, what's the reason people would, would come and buy a product and come and give money to a company in order to, for exchange for some service or product or offering? And there's some questions here um, that are the key, the key sort of things to, to address within that. Just try and think about how does your product makes somebody else's life better. So how is their life improved by the addition of what you're, you're offering, whether that's a service, a piece of hardware, you know, but all of those, those sorts of aspects, the different aspects should enhance somebody else's life, otherwise they're not going to part with their hard-earned cash for it. The, the thing that um, I think you know, marketing then kind of fits in with showing the customer how their life is improved by your product. And it all hangs off this, this value proposition of how do we make sure that we do what we say we do and deliver what we, we say we deliver. So there any questions on that bit? Do you think this is kind of it? You know, if you take nothing else away from this talk, this is the slide, which is a rubbish slide in terms of, you know, in terms of graphics and things, but the, the key thing is, you know, what are you trying to add value? And it's difficult within the UAS challenge because you've kind of already got a, this is the remit, it needs to fly to a certain direction and drop a payload. So what, in what, part of the challenge in doing the business case is trying to identify an application where that's valuable. Any questions? So the customer is the next thing. So if you've got a key value proposition, if you understand how that your customer's life is going to be improved, then how do you 
identify who your customers are. You know, can you actually get access to a customer or a potential customer while you're doing the UAS challenge? If someone, you know, we did have a couple last year, last year of business cases where they said, we've talked to these people, this is what we understand as their needs, and this is what we understand as their, their problems, and this is the value that a system would add to them. So they've joined the dots from the value proposition to their customer needs. And they've identified what the key aspect of their lives that's going to be improved is through, through their product. The next thing is to work back and to try and work out how you develop a relationship with your customer. So some um, different sections of the market will, will want to interact in different ways. Have we got existing relationships? Are there relationships that you can build? Is it going to be international? Is it going to be within the UK? Do you need things like agents and, and people on the ground? If you were going to be selling into a particular market, would you want to make sure that your company had somebody representing you? Do you need to go on to catalogues? Do you, there's a whole load of stuff within there. Sorry, I should put both up. Because they're all these are kind of linked. You know, how do you reach out to your customer and say, here's my value, in which in, in your market segment we understand what your needs are. You know, marketing fits into this as one of the channels that you communicate with your customer. And the relationships are are key to that. So everything, for, in terms of business, everything hinges off relationship, and that's the way that I very much you know, try and work, is to try and cultivate good relationships and to try and cultivate that the people are able to come and talk to you about their problems, and then that's what helps with the, the product development, because then your products match with what their, their needs are. So moving back across into the sort of the internal side of the, the business model canvas is to try and understand what activities do we need to do to, to meet our value proposition. How are we going to um, identify what the revenue streams are to be able to support those key activities and what resources do we need. Do we need a, a workshop? Can we build it in our garage? If a customer says we want to come and see your production facility and to see where your, your equipment's stored because we're going to buy a system for so many thousand pounds, is that okay? Are they going to want to come to a, to a garage or do they need to see some level of, of um, you know, investment in production facilities? And the key partners, so within large aerospace, this is now you're starting to talk about the supply chain. How do you manage where you source your parts? If you're procuring on open market, can you always guarantee the supply of your parts? How much of it's under, under your control? How much of it are you incumbent on other people? What services do you need? Do you need people to be able to deliver your products? Do you need people to operate your products? How do you have partners that, that so if, if you um, say you were to, to offer your platform to a company that does aerial surveys, What's the, the, the model? Do they procure from you and, and just they're a customer or do they lease and have a, a, a their, their revenue stream is easier because they just buy it by the hour and you just keep offering them new systems? So all, all of this side of saying, you know, who, who are the partners? Who's going to actually work with you to achieve, achieve your goals? And lastly, I, I, I'm particularly, you know, with the sort of spreadsheet hat on, so I want to see you've got control of your major costs and what your major revenue streams are. How are you going to make money and how much do you need to spend in order to get there? The, the thing when you're doing the presentation and when you're writing the business case, I think is to, to imagine you've got an investor sat next to you who's giving you some money and wants it back all the time. So every time you, you, you know, you're, you're doing your activities, this investor's just, yeah, that's great. I want my money back, you know, as quickly as possible, because that's if someone's invested in the business, then they they are they've invested for a reason. They see potential in you, but they also want to see a return on that on that money. Unless you're Amazon, apparently, because they they don't seem to make a profit and nobody seems to care. I don't know quite quite how that works. So, is there any questions on this? I'd like to, as I said a minute ago, I'd like to work through it with you guys. Um,
and do it collaboratively rather than just me sat, standing and talking to you, because it's a warm meeting room on a hot sunny day. Um, is there any questions on this section? Uh, there's a couple of other things I want to I want to talk about. But how many of how many of the three teams have done this exercise? Because after we sort of handed it to you uh, after Peter's visit, you've done it, right, yeah. Steve? I've not done all of them, but we filled in. I've started. That, yeah, yeah. we're yeah. yeah. filling everything. We just take off. Yeah. Okay. So, any sort of you know feedback now? Any challenges or things you weren't sure of? Or questions about process? Or are you happy? I've got one question about assumptions. Obviously, if this was a, a real business that we were going to set up, we'd go into a hell of a lot of detail. Say, I don't know, that if you're going to buy 100 motors, yeah. you expect some kind of discount on the retail price. Yep. Yeah. Is it fair to make an assumption that you could, say, have 10% off? Or yeah, I think that's fine. Um, so the, the, the caveat to that is, you know, is that really going to make that big a difference to your business model? You know, if 10% on your motors is, is that big a driver, then you're, you're quite exposed to your supplier putting the price up by 10%. Yeah, you know, so, so yeah, I think it's fine. And, you know, if you make an assumption like that, I've got no problem with, with people doing things like that. But on your Pareto analysis, you know, that's the, trying to work out what the major drivers are and try how you can control them. I mean, if it's that you buy 100 motors up front so that you can eliminate any variation in the supply chain, you know, again, that's, that's a fair comment. Of course, the amount of money you'll need to be bigger and your business case becomes less attractive. Mm -hmm. So, yes? Uh, in our business case, uh, we are assuming our business is uh, the one we sell surface, such as uh, aerial survey or documentary, but mm -hmm. we also make our own drones and sell it to consumer. So as a startup uh, business, is it a challenging, uh, is there any way we can survive? I mean, we have two different segments of customer. Yeah, so yeah, it's challenging, because right. you've got two different channels to, to define, and you're potentially competing against your customer. So if you're offering surveys and your customer's buying a product to perform aerial surveys, you're, because you make the product and yeah. your cost that you've paid for the product is less than the, product, the price you sell it for, you can undercut the competition. So it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult model to make work because of that fact, because you are effectively competing against your, your customer. If you can... If you can delineate them, if you can separate them, you can say, okay, look, we'll operate in the UK, but we'll sell to customers overseas. Or if we, you know, if, if you can make, if you can stop that competitive element, so you're not competing with your customer, then the business model will look more attractive and look stronger. But at, at the moment, that's a, a, yeah, it sounds like a challenge to make work. Concrete one. Yeah. When we come to setting, forecasting our sales in the future, using yeah. that bell curve. What's what's the next slide. Other, what, what's a good way of roughly knowing how many we could estimate of selling, apart from looking at another company's business model? Yeah, that's so. Matching it. Market survey, so you can say that, so. There's companies like Frost and Sullivan um, and other companies that, that show we anticipate there will be this much with um, volume within the marketplace. And I don't know if you've seen this number that UAVs are supposed to count for 10% of the aerospace industry. So that's all projected. Through uh, um, by volume of how much we people predict that UAVs are going to get um, taken up. So yeah, market reports, but also yeah, looking at how other companies have, have managed to do it. I think um, the danger with that is that you can end up presenting quite a pessimistic business case because you you look at somebody else's and you you can sort of well, I mean there's there's companies like. Um, I probably won't mention companies by name, but there's, there's companies who have been in business a while and haven't sold yeah. products, who have managed to keep going on the strength of you know investor funding or R and D funding from different routes, and haven't actually got to the product point of product sale. So it, it can you know lead to a quite yeah. pessimistic business case. Because it's difficult to gauge you know if we've got a product that's got a new a new a piece piece of it, a new idea. You could assume well, everyone's going to jump to this product then. Yeah. But they might not. They might want to stay with a reliable brand that's already been out there. 
then yeah. so we can look at other business models, but we can't just assume we're going to get 50% of what they're getting. Yeah, and, and that's so if you have got a competitive differentiator, if you can yeah. show that your product is different from everybody else's, there's something there that's the, 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 the one that gets talked about a lot is, is Marmite. There are other people that make that, yeah. you know, that product, and but people keep coming back to the brand, that people keep coming back to it is different from everybody else, and it and even the competitors sell it in tubs with yellow lids, and you yeah. know, it's all. But the, the, if you can establish a position quickly, and if you can establish capability quickly, you know that's one <coughs> one way of doing it is to offer a discount to the first few customers, yeah. or to offer it for free to a you know a, a key customer that then shows it in the marketplace, shows that it's. Yeah. If you can also try and convince, um, if you can if you can show that your it's not worth competing with you, then you'll find that people. Yeah. You know, that's the other thing within the business case to show that it's just not worth competing because you've either established dominance or you're at a price point that's difficult to compete with. Or then you can you can try and sort of establish a good market position from that. Yeah. Is, is it ever sense to almost send your products out for free? Uh, obviously, if it's not a massive expensive product, so that people then start using them, they do YouTube videos, and then people start buying them from those reviews. So. Amazon do exactly that. Yeah. So they they send they have. Um, what's called Vine reviewers, they have Amazon Vine and they send people products, they then review them and that's 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 effectively how they pay for the, yeah. the, the so people then, they usually declare that oh, I've got this product for free from Amazon yeah. and then I reviewed it. Yeah. I, I mean that's a different scale because you're in sort of the, very much the consumer tech where they're selling you know, hundreds and thousands of, of systems and um, then you get economies of scale then as well. So you, you know because you're buying a hundred thousand batteries or hundred thousand motors, it's yeah. it's quite you know it's quite, it's quite a diff different market. If you look at the numbers for somebody like DJI and the number of platforms they shift, you know the purchasing power that they have is yeah. just incredible. I used to work in the mobile phone industry, and typical volume was going to be five or six million per handset. And then you know if you ask a supplier, I need a sample or I need Five samples, or tens. It's just, it's not a problem. Certainly, when you're talking about electronics and systems that are developing quickly, <coughs> I'm developing myself a business off of what I have now. Say, you know, one of these platforms are designing for this year's competition. It's hard to to sort of compensate and say, yeah, it'll still be a viable product two or three years down the line yeah. because something new might come out. How do you try and compensate for that? Because obviously you're not going to get through all the way from a concept through development through testing to a product in you know three months. It's going to take a while. How do you try and, and balance that risk of of something new coming out? How do you represent it when you're coming into your business case? Yeah. So I'll skip a couple of slides and then maybe come back. So. I'll talk. You, let me talk you through this, and, and then we'll try and I'll, I'll try and get you to that, that point. So the gate, the gated development process is is part. That's part of that process. Is that if a new entrant arrives at a certain stage, you have an exit strategy. So you can say, okay, look, we've we've invested a certain amount of money to get here, but we've now identified a new a new entrant. So we're going to halt development and look and reevaluate our strategy. And it may be that you you try and pivot towards a different a different solution. So you, you know if a competitor comes out and you've targeted a certain market, you may move away from competing directly alongside them. So for example in the UAV division you might go down a weight class or up a weight class to try and avoid a direct competition. Whereas if your product was against it, you're sharing a market with, with a competitor. Even if you're successful you're still sharing a market. Um, the other thing is to is to try and Look at how you manage that that risk. You know, when I was talking earlier about trying to identify what all the risks are. So try and put probability against it. That if, if a new company, you know, if a new company comes onto the market, how are they going to get funding quicker than you? How are they going to hit the market faster than you? How are they going to beat you? You know, and just try and quantify what those risks are. And it's it's predicting the this was I mean, it's the whole answer it's, my opening slide was it's hard it's difficult predicting the future and 
you know, the best you can do is to say, I've, I've tracked down as many of these different products as possible and identified who my main competitors are. And a nice sort of way of working out how real a concept is is to, to ring a company to try and buy one. That's quite a, you know, to actually try and ring up and, and try and purchase a system. Sometimes you get, do you know what, you, you know what I mean by vaporware, where people yeah. show a product, particularly now with things like 3D printing, it's very easy to produce something that looks like a very credible solution that potentially might scare you know, a competitor off from competing in that marketplace. But actually, when you, if you were actually to, to try and procure one, you'd find out that it's on a two-year delivery, which kind of indicates it doesn't really exist. So one of the things that... Um, I, 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 it's a slight deviation from that. One of the things that... I, I, the, I don't know if you guys have seen this sort of curve before. They're looking at the cash flow within a, within a business. So if you were to look at what, how much money is in the bank over time, this is the sort of curve that um, would be produced. And we, uh, we didn't see many of these last year in, the, in the, um, the business cases that were submitted. And the, I'm just going to try and... So the depth of that hole is the level of investment that you need. So if you can, if you can introduce your risks within the business and you can work out this curve will shift around depending on whether you are quicker in development or slower in development, whether you start taking orders quickly or whether it actually takes you a longer time. And you can try and play with the, the, um, you know, the variances on the different numbers within that. So if you know what the level of investment is, you can shift your curve up and make sure that you stay, stay cash positive the entire time. So this, this here should be, you know, if I, if I went to an investor at the beginning, I took an investment, I even got it laid, laid. I took an investment in, in a business for a certain amount of money, I would be able to pay it back at break even here, if I had a, a sustainable model. It might be that you'd wait a little bit more so you had some balance, you didn't just go back down to zero in the bank again. But this, this sort of modeling, I don't know, is this the sort of thing you guys have got in your business cases for this year? Is this what? We haven't gotten that far. Okay. It's, really, I, I, I'm trying to sum up a little bit so I'm not talking at you for the entire afternoon. You know, focus on demonstrating that you understand how much money you need, or how long you need to borrow it from me as, as, a, as a tame investor, and tell me when you're going to start making money and when you're going to break even. And those four questions are really easy to ask. And really tough to answer. There's a lot of unknowns in there. There's a lot of modelling of risk. There's a lot of trying to capture things that don't want to stay um, tied down. You know, if you have a, a, a crash in the middle of your development cycle and you don't understand where that crash has come from, that could delay things by weeks as you try and work out if there's a, a bug in your, your, flight con your flight control system. You try to understand where those key risk factors come in from. If you're incumbent on somebody else's code, for example, and they introduce a feature that doesn't let you fly in certain locations and your customer really needs to fly in that location because they have permission to be there, how do you go about addressing that? You know, how do you go about making sure that you can deliver what you said you could deliver when, when the customer bought it? The, the other thing was just to be able to show if I've got an amount of money and I'm going to burn it in a certain amount of time, how quickly am I going to burn it? How quickly am I going to get to a point where we have no money left? So this is the, the straight line is predicted, the red line is that's going well. We are completing our tasks faster than the money's going to run out, which would be great. And sometimes things work like that, sometimes, but sometimes they don't as well. How is um, risk of capital measured or, or viewed? I mean, 
if I go to an investor and say, oh, yeah, give me a million pound of your money, he might turn around to me and say, well, how much money are you putting in? How much risk are you taking? And if you're not prepared to take a risk, why should I, why should I take a bet on you? I think that comes down to what the business model is. So if you're saying the opportunity is to invest in a company and you take a percentage stake in the company, that's different from investing in in somebody and you know it's a sole trader and you're effectively funding them for the next few months um, the and again usually an investor wants some sort of return if it's a you know I've, I've said basically it's a you know this is like a bank loan you would go and take some money from the bank and you give it back in a certain amount of time you pay back a certain amount of interest typically an investor you know like an, a, a venture capitalist or an angel investor they're actually usually investing in the person. They're usually investing in the, the person they can see. They can't usually touch the product. They might be able to see a prototype, but they, they don't go, you know, they can't see, you know, typically they can't, we wouldn't go and see a flying, one of these flying at a, an, an investment pitch. You, you'd be talking about, you know, I, I have control of the, the finances, the business plan is fine. So yeah, they, they Asking somebody to, to put their, their money on the line is, I think it's a fair enough thing if they really believe in their business model. But in, in some respects, by taking a share of the business, you are kind of asking them to put their business, business on the line. And, and we all watch Dragon's Den, is that or something like that? You know, it's that sort of, you know, it is people, people do, to get to the sort of stage where they have a business case to be able to present, people have typically done things like to get the business up to a point where it's running and it, 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 they've already done things like taken their, put their house back on the market or taken bank loans or maxed out their credit cards to get to a point where they've got a working prototype, they've protected their IP, they've engaged with, with factories who are going to scale up should, should the orders come through. Yeah, but they're, it, it, having a viable long-term business model, there's, there's lots of elements that are needed in it. And I think, I think it's, it's a, a difficult question for, for you guys to answer as part of the challenge, because it's not, it's not what you're all focused on. You know, it's kind of a, a side task against trying to get the UAV flying. But it's, an e, well, it's not an easy way to win marks. It's another way to win marks as well as flying. I think to neglect the business case would be, would, you know, we, we did have teams that just didn't, didn't submit one last year. And it does put you out, you know, effectively put you out of the running for, for winning the, the grand prize. That's everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I'll ask one question. In terms of our customer, because we had a lot of debates about who the customer is, is the customer, in your opinion, the RMA key for the competition? Is it the humanity of an aid agency who would fly these sort of things in a disaster zone, or is it governments who would pay the bill at the end of the day? Which one of those is are we trying to impress, or is it all three, is it? So the, the customer is the person who's going to give you money. <clears throat> so governments, are they footing the bill at the end of the day, or the humanitarian aid who has a budget that based on who's going to physically write the check with your name on it as a as a as a business if you're you know you're start, if this is out of this you have a business proposition who is going to write you that check that's your customer yes then how would you sort like an investor that you're talking to in the beginning of the process would, would you put him as a partner or would you put him as customer yeah key he's, partner, right? he's supplying a, he's a key partner supplying a key resource which yeah. is cash yeah with regards to investment, are, are medias like um, Kickstarter a viable, credible pit to put in the business case? Yeah, I don't, I don't see why not. It's, it's it, it could be hit or miss you know, if you get investment or not. Yeah, I mean, I, I saw, I, I, I saw um, a Kickstarter this week where somebody had tried to crowdfund accommodation, um, so they'd been turned down by a housing association and looked to crowdfund accommodation. And, and out of the two hundred thousand pounds they've requested, they've actually got twenty pounds. Yeah. So, the, so I don't know how you quantify the risk in your business model of, of but you, your exposure is low. 
to do because effectively they're giving you their product order money up front. I know it's not an order, they're investing in the company, but your exposure to not delivery is relative, relatively low. Mm. The, I don't, do, you, do you know the Zano drone? Yeah. So that's been in the media a lot, but the risk to the, to the, to the guys that actually did the kick stuff, I don't think they've suffered a great deal of negative consequence in terms of you know, actually financially those those people who set the company up. I don't think they they lost their houses and mm. things things like that. It's the the you know people weren't buying the product; they're investing in a business in return for receiving the product on the end. It's it's a, such a new model. It's just not. Reputational damage for them now. <coughs> they're dead in the water, right? Because if they ever come back, to surface their heads again. You know, the name is forever tarnished with that Zano label. Yeah, and if you're, if you're, a, you know, if you're a, a startup like that, if you bring bring, but you know, who, there's no guarantees that as a startup they'll ever do another. Pro I mean, personal reputation damage. You're right, mm -hmm. but you know, it's, it, it, and that's a risk. That it? again, it's. How do you manage that risk? How do you say? If you didn't hit funding, that's that's one thing. You know, if you didn't hit funding, we, we did this. There wasn't a market need for it. You could quite easily prove that there wasn't a market need. But if it's that you know you've taken the money and you've not delivered, that's something else entirely. Because they only failed because they didn't have a working prototype when they did the Kickstarter campaign. So you know that's a mistake on their behalf as opposed to you know had they not done that or had they had one, then they would have still got the funding and. Yeah, but that mean, meant they could go to kick, they could go to get investment, having spent less themselves yeah. by not having a working press. Like. So it, their their exposure was was lower. I mean, I can't I can't yeah. comment on them on a person, but it's just you know from looking outside, that's how how it seems to have happened. It was one of the biggest Kickstarter campaigns of two, over two million pounds. Mm -hmm. So that in a sense shows the the strength of the the buoyancy of that small. UAV market, if you like, the motor rotor market. Um, in terms of a toy, you might argue. Yeah, I mean, the, the yeah, I think it's the price point that they were trying to hit as well. So they they were trying to hit a certain. I think that you know, understanding what your value proposition is within that market is it's a low cost, highly capable product that's using existing. For, protocols for communications and it was using you had the map on a phone so you don't even have to supply the ground control station it's somebody else's ground control station so that, that was quite easily offset so it was a low price point and yeah you're right they sold well, effectively they took orders for, for lots mm. and I think it's a real shame I think it's a shame that they yeah. weren't successful any other questions or? I've got another one quick one when it comes, we have a value of how much our UAVs cost to make um, as a one-off. When it comes to then working out how much profit we want to make, uh, I assume initially you're not going to make much profit, if any. You just want to get the product out there. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you sort of work out when to start raising the profit? I guess it's when you've got cash coming in. You know, you can risk it's, not selling as many. It's difficult to raise a price once you've established the yeah. price point in the marketplace. Okay. So you. You might offer a discount for the first few customers, okay. and that's the way Kickstarter do it. They, you, you have a, they have a RR, you know, recommended retail price, and they offer a discount for Kickstarter, and then they usually offer an early bird for the first few. But the actual price is still, the price point is still established. Um, it, it, it just comes down to the numbers. Okay. You know, um, what's the typical profit? One. Um, entrant last year, I think they put that they were going to make five percent profit on their systems, which, yeah, it's just not enough. It's not enough. Is that when you include taking up salary and building costs and machinery? Yeah. Okay. Because you're 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 exposed. You know, if there is a change in your supply base, you're exposed to that to that price. So you, at the bare minimum, the profit margin needs to be enough to be able to absorb those sorts of um, fluctuations in the in the market. As for a number, um, it, it's, no, it's, it's it's market dependent. So something like you know a, a high value luxury brand tends to have more profit built in mm. because they have to then address all the marketing and because they don't sell many. So you know something like a, a, a something like a tag watch compared to a swatch. You know that those there's different profit margins on those, but they sell in different volumes. Yeah. 
this is sort of low volume, low cost, right? Mm. So it kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a, not one side or the other side, is it? It's sort of, a, it's, ha it's a hybrid, one half in one camp and one half in the other camp. It's kind of a, a tricky market to enter. I, nobody says it has to be low retail price, even if it's low cost. It depends what your market's built at and what your customer can, can stand in terms of a price. Is there any scope for um, <coughs> copywriting designs, intellectual property protection, things like that, or including that in business planning for this sort of activity? So, including a cost for engaging a lawyer or a patent attorney, um, and yeah, fine. I don't, you know, that's not, I don't think there's a problem with including that, in, and it might be prudent to do so. Do the UAS challenge require you to have that in there? I don't, I don't believe so. Yeah. But, you know, if you think there's something innovative and you could show, you know, we, we, we've talked to, a, talked to somebody about protecting our IP to try and ensure that we have a competitive advantage and a competitive differentiator, you know, that, that would be something that would stand out in the business case as being a favourable. Well, thanks very much for